Welcome to Washington Hospital Healthcare Systems Community Forum on Anti-Asian Hate. We are so grateful you have joined us today for this important discussion. Washington Hospital condemns hate and violence of all kinds. We just want to begin the discussion about the topic, which is particularly relevant here in Southern Alameda County. I would especially like to thank our moderator, Suzanne Chan, and panelists for sharing their expertise today. Suzanne is going to introduce the panelists in just a few minutes. Before I hand over the mic, I just want to make a couple of housekeeping notes. So um, when you entered in, if you need a bathroom, it's on, when you enter into Washington West, it's on the right-hand side there. There's water, tea, and coffee in the back of the room, and we have provided boxed lunches for the attendees. Please take these with you rather than eating them here to keep everybody safe. So with that, I'm going to invite Kimberly Hartz, our Chief Executive Officer of Washington Hospital Healthcare System, to the podium. Uh, thank you, Tina. I just want to welcome everyone. It is so wonderful. I was just, just talking to Dr. Sagal about this, how wonderful it is to actually see people and have that contact. And it's been a long time. This is really one of our first um, community-wide in-person events. And I think it is so important that we're having this here in person and being able to, to be with each other. Um, but before I start and make a few remarks, I would like to recognize our dignitaries that are here today. First of all, I wanna start with our Washington Township Healthcare District Board of Directors. And to begin with, uh, Jeannie Yi, our president, please stand. <laughs> Dr. Bernard Stewart, our first vice president. And Dr. William Nich Nicholson, our secretary. And I don't think, unfortunately, Mike Wallace, our second vice president, and Dr. Jacob Epen, our treasurer, was able to attend today. Um, so I want to then also take a moment to um, recognize our elected officials. Uh, from Fremont Unified School District, we have Diane Jones. Stand up, thank you. Uh, we have acting president of Ohlone Community College, Tony DeSalvo. <laughs> He's behind the, the phone over there, yes. Uh, Fremont Human Relations Commissioner, Anna Wang. And I, I also do want to recognize uh, graciously your husband, Dr. Albert Wang, uh, graciously translated our flyer with your, with your help. So thank you very much. So we appreciate that. So I know we're all very anxious to get started, but I just want to say a few remarks. Um, and I want to thank all of you for taking time out of your busy schedules to be here with us for this really important uh, topic. I guess I, I want to say that never in my 25 years of working here at Washington Hospital could I have ever imagined that we would be holding um, and hosting a forum like today's. As your local community healthcare system, I realize we must take a far broader view of what constitutes healthcare if we're going to ensure that we meet our community's healthcare needs now and into the future. We must ask ourselves some very important questions. What else is impacting our community's health? Are we doing everything we can to provide healthcare equitably to all residents of the district? Are there social or environmental factors present in the community that disproportionately impact specific populations? We're hosting this community forum, taking into account these important questions. And I will also say, after a cardiologist and board member, Dr. William Nicholson, mentioned to me how scared many of his Asian senior patients were about leaving the house for doctor's appointments. It was this important concern and the many senseless acts of violence that we have all heard about involving Asian Pacific Islanders doing things like walking in their neighborhood, waiting to take public transportation, pushing their baby's stroller, or collecting recyclables in the neighborhood that led us to host this community forum. As you will hear from our panelists, the fear of being subjected to anti-Asian hate is not unfounded. This hate comes in many forms, anything from anti-Asian rhetoric on our streets and on the national stage, to harassment or physical violence just about anywhere. And this is happening in our communities, 
as well as in our cities and towns throughout our country. It is shameful that in this day and age, our Asian Pacific Islander friends and neighbors should have to worry about racism and attacks of any form because of their race or ethnicity. The bottom line is that fear of violence is very real. We have all heard of one too many stories involving unprovoked hate and violence against a person because of their race or ethnicity. And the trauma created by this climate is real and it's impacting the lives and well-being of our API community members and many other vulnerable populations. While we noticed violence rise against the API community shortly after COVID-19 impacted our daily lives, violence against Asian Pacific Islanders has been happening in silence for far too long. We must all be part of the collective effort and conversation to raise awareness, advocate for change, and find solutions so that everyone can live safely. We all have a human right to live freely and enjoy our communities equally. As Tina said, Washington Hospital stands against all forms of violence and hatred. And we want to do what we can to, do, to counter this disturbing trend. I recognize every day that we still have much to do. We know that people's health is profoundly influenced by many factors outside the healthcare system. Racism, education, housing, poverty, hunger, and employment are just a few. If we are truly to achieve our mission of improving the well being of our community, we must be part of the solutions to these problems also. Thank you. And now I'd like to call up uh, Suzanne Chan to uh, do the introductions. Thank you so much, Kimberly, for those very moving and powerful words. And it really sets the stage for um, the conversation that we're going to be having today. And so um, I would like to have our panelists join us on the stage, please. And we'll get to introductions. But as I said, I think I'm, in, I'm socially distanced enough that I take off my mask. <laughs> um, again, thank you for joining us today to have this frank discussion about anti-Asian hate and violence. Several months ago, many physicians and healthcare uh, professionals had been expressing um, concerns by their Asian um, patients that uh, were having uh, anxiety and concern about the increasing uh, incidents of anti-hate and violence, which has dramatically escalated um, at a very alarming rate during the pandemic. Unfortunately, Angus can't be here today, but I do want to thank him for his leadership in uh, organizing this event. We have planned um, to do about a 45 minute presentation, and then I'll be followed by a question and answer. Um, but um, one of the things I, just to set the stage, is that I wanted to share with you a few statistics that from 2000, 2000 to 2019, the AAPI, and that's Asian American Pacific Islander, uh, population grew by 57%. And the, it was the fastest growth of any racial or ethnic group in the entire Bay Area. The Chinese population is the largest group, racial group, and that was at 30%, followed by the Indian and Filipino X at 16%, Vietnamese 8%, Korean 4%, and Japanese 3%, and Taiwanese uh, population at 2%. Cases of anti-Asian hate crimes rose 107% in 2020, but an additional 177% increased just last year. Verbal harassment uh, constitutes about 63% of, of uh, incidents, and those are oftentimes not even reported. So uh, California Attorney General Rob Bonta has termed this the epidemic of hate that targets not only Asian Pacific Islander, but other ethnic groups as well. So uh, right now I'd like to introduce our um, 
panelists, our esteemed panelists, and thank them so much for being here and being a part of this very important discussion. Uh, we'll start over to my far right. This is Dr. Russell Jung, who, Jung, who is a professor of Asian American Studies at San Francisco State. In 2021, he received the Excellence in Professional Achievement Award. And he is the author of a number of books and articles on race and religion. In March 2020, Dr. Jung co-founded Stop Asian, I'm sorry, Stop AAPI Hate with uh, Chinese for Affirmative Action and the Asian Pacific Policy and Planning Council. It tracks the number of COVID-19 discrimination to develop policy interventions and long-term solutions to racism. Stop AAPI uh, Hate was awarded the 2021 Webby Award for Social Movement of the Year. And in 2021 also, Dr. Jung was named as one of, of Time 100, Bloomberg 50, and Political 40 of Most Influential. Welcome. <laughs> Next up is Dion Lim. Dion Lim is an Emmy awarding, uh, award winning TV news anchor and reporter for ABC7 and KGO TV in San Francisco. She's also an author. Dion is passionate about amplifying voices of color and has led the charge worldwide in shedding light on the hate and the assaults against Asian Americans in the Bay Area. She's been recognized for her dedication in reporting on discrimination and xenophobia against Asian Americans and the black community. Whether reporting or being interviewed herself, Dion's message is loud and clear. Representation matters more now than ever before, and that we can do it through communication. Welcome, Dion. <laughs> Next, we have Dr. Seema Segal who is a board certified psychiatrist in, here in Fremont uh, with over 25 years of experience. She completed her psychiatric um, residency from the California Pacific Medical Center in San Francisco. Having worked with underserved and ethnically diverse populations and being a first generation uh, immigrant herself, she has extensive knowledge in treating multicultural manifestations on psychological distress. She brings this uh, expertise to the Washington Hospital Medical Foundation, where she currently practices. She donates her time to local schools and nonprofit organizations to increase awareness in the variety of mental health issues. Thank you, Dr. Thay. Next up is uh, Sergeant Calvin Tang who has been with the Fremont Police Department for 12 years, and he's currently supervises the school resource officers units and is a team leader on the department's hostage negotiation team. Mm. Pretty serious. <laughs> <laughs> you haven't had to do too many of those. Uh, as a detective and patrol sergeant, he has held many different types of assignments, including sexual assault and child abuse. Sergeant Tang is an Oakland native, and a first generation Chinese American, so am I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> who was raised learning Cantonese and Toisan, uh, which is a dialect of, of Cantonese. He holds a BA in psychology from Northwestern University and an MS in criminal justice from USC. As you can see, we have assembled a very impressive panel who's, who are going to be sharing their expertise as they educate and inform us. Racial and discrimination and inequity are not unique to Asians, but has been pervasive throughout America's history. It's important to understand the nature of this racism. So let's begin with Dr. Jung, who, as I said, is the co-founder of Stop API Hate, who will share his insightful remarks on combating anti-AAPI hate during COVID-19. Dr. Jung. Well, thanks, Suzanne, and thank you, Washington Hospital, for hosting us today. I'm honored to be with this distinguished panel and um, really grateful for what um, Washington Hospital is doing for the community, recognizing that racism is a health issue, right? It's impacting our well-being, our mental health, and our health. And so um, really 
excited to talk to you, to be in person again, and to um, share what we've been learning at Stop AAPI Hate. So when we created Stop AAPI Hate, it's a website reporting center two years ago. We created it because we knew from SARS and from previous diseases that came from Asia that Asians would get blamed and face racism. So I don't know if you remember SARS, people were avoiding Asians. When we coughed, people became scared. And so I was really attentive to um, COVID-19 when it was arriving. And um, we launched this reporting center and immediately we were getting hundreds of incidents of racism every day. And I was just stunned, first of all, because I didn't know how anybody heard about our website. And then secondly, just the veracity, the, um, the pervasiveness of the racism. Over the last two years though, despite the pain and the trauma, I've really seen a global movement arise, and that's what's been heartening. So what I want to talk about are some of the lessons we've learned in the last two years. And I'm calling it Be Like Water. It's a Bruce Lee term, but I'm not copying Bruce Lee. It's more from Taoism. And as I've experienced and seen how much trauma Asians have faced, um, there's a particular therapist um, an NYU professor named Doris Tang, who's developed a Taoist cognitive behavioral therapy based on Taoism. And so she talks about how um, she uses Taoist philosophies to change people's thinking about their depression and anxiety. And I liked it so much that I've adapted it and I've extended this notion of being like water to not only address um, our mental health concerns, but also how to make institutional change. So I think we have learned to become like water, that water is clear, it's humble, it's persistent, and it's restorative. And I'll talk about three of these aspects since I have a little bit of time. So water is, first of all, humble. I like this um, quality of water. Water doesn't fight back, but rather goes with the flow. Water seeks alternative ways to reach its ultimate source, I think in America now, the natural response to racism is to fight back, to, for Asians, for themselves, to become angry and then just repeat a cycle of violence. We would either want to fight back, buy guns, want to arrest people, which make, makes sense. But I think um, that just, violence only leads to more violence. And I know that people who are hurt, hurt other people. And so as we're, um, being traumatized during this moment, we need to learn how to be humble, recognizing that we can become racist ourselves. Um, so to give you a sense of humility and to understand what's happening, um, I want to share some incidents that have happened. Um, customer began screaming at me for no reason while online and correctly distanced. I was standing in an aisle at a hardware store when suddenly I was struck from behind. Video surveillance verifying the incident in which a white male using his bent elbow striking my upper back. Subsequent verbal attacks occurred with, shut up you monkey, F you Chinaman, go back to China, bringing that Chinese virus over here. So here you could see why people are attacking us, right? We're being blamed for COVID-19 and we're being told to go back. Um, surprisingly, in the last year, the number of Americans who believe Asians are to be blamed for COVID-19, Asians in the US, has actually doubled. So people who, despite people not wearing masks, despite people not being vaccinated, they're still blaming Asians, us, for the rise in COVID. Oh, this one was cut off. Um, I'll skip the second one. But he was attacked and he says, I'm mostly Chinese and my family has been in San Luis Obispo since the 1860s. I'm fourth generation in San Luis Obispo, but guess I will never be an American. So in this attack where he was um, again yelled at like the first person, how Asians are made to feel is excluded, right? That even though he's been in the US for four generations, he doesn't feel like he could count as a real authentic American. I think that sense of shame, the sense of being excluded, of being invisible in America is what um, Asian Americans are feeling. We're seen as outsiders, right? Perpetual foreigners. And this last incident, 
I was shopping and a child grabbed my arm. Child said I should go back to my country and I was the reason his father died. Mother came up and put her hand on my arm, but she didn't try to help me. Bakersfield has ignorant people who make fun of how I would talk and look and tell me to go home. But this is the scariest and saddest experience I've had in the US. So this case is particularly terrible because a kid who obviously learned racism um, told an adult to go back. It's terrible because the mother didn't do anything, right? And so in a lot of our cases, there was no intervention from bystanders. And Asians complain, no one came to help. But I use this example to show that she's felt scared and sad. And that sense of fear, that sense of depression, are signs of trauma. And so I'm calling this period one of collective racial trauma because Asians are experiencing heightened fear, heightened anxiety, hypervigilance where they're always watching out for themselves, avoidance of places. So I know my mom, she said she wouldn't go out except for in Chinese areas, right? She's 95 years old. She's experiencing de facto segregation today because of this violence. And so she's just relegated to certain places. So you can see um, the types of racism we're experiencing. Not everything is a crime. Two thirds of the cases involve harassment. Down here, 11% of the cases involve um, civil rights violations. Youth especially experience online harassment. Um, the trends we've seen have been consistent over the last two years. It's clear racial profiling. Even though people blame Chinese or China for COVID, if you just look Asian, you could be attacked. And so 57% of our response are non-Chinese. They could be Vietnamese, Filipinos. A Latino person in LA was punched and told to go back to China. And an indigenous person in Vancouver was attacked and told to go back to China. Bullies attack those whom they think they can bully. So youth, elderly, and women are more vulnerable, more targeted. And working class Asians face two times the amount of racism. And that makes sense because they're essential workers, right? They can't stay at home and work online. They have to work in the public and therefore they get attacked twice as much. So we have to identify and be humble with other marginalized groups. You know, um, water sinks to the roots, water stays among the lowliest places. And I think Asians now are feeling pretty low. And we have to recognize, a lot of times we think we're the model minority, but we're not. And we have to recognize we're being attacked, and we have to be humble and be concerned not only about the attacks, but then also wanting to fight back and excite more violence. So water is also clear. And water's clarity helps us get to the roots of issues. Water's mindfulness helps us to be um, thoughtful in how we deal with this racism. And so we need to be clear about the impacts of racism so that we could deal with it well. In terms of mental health, as I said, this is a period of collective racial trauma. Asians are among the worst um, groups in the US now who experience mental health issues. Um, not only are we concerned about the pandemic, but those of us who experience racism have higher rates of stress and anxiety. And this is the scariest fact. When asked, what's your greatest stressor during the pandemic, Asian Americans overwhelmingly said racism. So think about this. We're in the middle of a pandemic that's killed over a million people, yet Asians are more fearful of other Americans and their hate. We're more scared of our neighbor than we are of a contagious disease. That just tells you how vulnerable we feel. That just tells you um, how random this racism is. You can wear a mask against COVID-19, you can get vaccinated, but you can't get vaccinated from some stranger just coming up and spitting on you, right, or, or pushing you. And that's why our mental health, and then um, my fellow panelists will talk about it, um, is so such an issue at this moment. We have to be clear on the impacts of racism in terms of our economy. Even before government shutdowns, Asian businesses were being avoided because people thought they could catch COVID-19 there. 
Um, as a result, those businesses shut down and had to lay off large portions of the Asian American working class. So here's a scary fact. 83% of Asian Americans with a high school degree or less had to file for unemployment. That's two and a half times more than others with similar backgrounds, right? Eight out of 10 Asians in the working class were unemployed in California. So because of racism, our economy has been impacted. And because of racism, it's not just interpersonal, it's been actually institutionalized. So because of COVID and concerns about COVID, President Trump actually banned Chinese scientists and researchers. He then extended the Muslim ban. He suspended migration visas overall so families couldn't reunite. He cut refugee resettlement. He cut H-1B visas for professional workers. All these policies disproportionately harmed Asians, right, and viewed us as a threat to the nation's health or public security. So we have to be clear. The, the, the impact of racism has been multidimensional and actually pretty devastating for our community. But water has another quality is that persistent. Even though water is humble and goes with the flow, um, even though water is considered soft, its persistence is powerful. And even though water may go with the flow, drop by drop it could break through rocks like this. And it eventually gets to its source. And for me in this period, our source, our path is towards racial justice. And our community, I think, has been really persistent in standing up for racial equity, racial justice, not only for ourselves, but for everyone. And so I've seen Asians of all walks of life stand up. Um, this is a group of middle schoolers who organized a 1,200 person rally. They created their own organization and they continue to this day to fight for ethnic studies. Our influencers have stood up and have been persistent and because they've been able to go on social media, um, they've gotten government to pay attention. They've gotten mainstream media to pay attention. And our community has really rallied, especially around our elders, have gone back to support Asian businesses and have really sought allies. Even today is an example of how we've been persistent in wanting to make change and fight. So the last quality that I want to talk about about water and about the Asian community is its restorative nature. This is a picture of Manzanar, um, if you know the Japanese American incarceration camp. It's right by Death Valley. And it's just a super dry, desolate place. But Japanese Americans during that time took what little water they had, and they were actually able to create beauty in the desolation. They were able to restore Manzanar and create these lush gardens. And that's the restorative nature of water, to bring new life, even when things seem really desperate. And I think that's what we see now that despite all the trauma, despite the devastation, I've really seen the Asian American community stand up and help restore this nation to be one that actually lives up to its values of equality. So let me tell you just a couple of the ways that we at Stop API Hate are advancing policies that we think are restorative, that will help renew America, that works together not to divide communities, but to try to bring them together to create policies that benefit everybody. Everybody agrees that the best way to address racism is through education. And so we're promoting educational efforts to teach Asian American narratives in the schools so that people learn about Asian American history and narratives. Currently, 19 states have legislation to require Asian American narratives in the school. 19 states, this is a huge movement going on just in the last year. So we at Stop APA Hate are coming around this movement and trying to promote the teaching of Asian American stories, literature, history, so that people could learn about us and that we could learn about other groups as well. We're pushing for expanding our civil rights. We, knew, we know that two-thirds of the cases involve street harassment, that women 
face the norm of being fearful when they go out on the streets that they may get catcalled or harassed on BART. And so we now have three bills in the California legislature to address this type of harassment. We're taking a public health approach, saying that racism is harmful to everybody's health. And so we're not putting this bill in the penal code to punish anybody, but we're saying because it's a health issue, we want to educate people how they could be more healthy, how we could treat each other with respect by, um, by not harassing each other. And we've been fighting for community safety for everyone. We were able to secure 156 million in California last year. And so now 80 organizations are addressing um, <clears throat> anti-Asian hate at, at the community level, working with neighbors to provide better victim services, working with neighbors, creating community ambassador programs. So since we created this model in California, New York passed a similar bill. So this is historic, right? For the first time, our governments are recognizing that Asians face disparities and need to be addressed. So thank you for listening. I just encourage you and all of us to be like water today, to be um, humble and recognize, yeah, this is a period of pain. To be clear, we have to be mindful of these impacts. We have to be thoughtful about how to address them. But then we can be persistent in pursuing justice with others. And in doing so, by being persistent, we could actually restore our society, our communities. So thank you very much. Wow. It's very, very insightful, Dr. Jung. Um, we really appreciate that uh, your presentation. I, it, uh, it's really something that uh, we know, some of us know firsthand, and some of us are just learning. And that's the whole point of what, why we're here today. So um, thank you so much for that. Uh, our next speaker is Dion Lim, uh, and uh, she's going to be speaking about... Um, well, first of all, we know that anti-Asian sentiment resurrected its ugly head with the onset of COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And then the, the then president filled the fire by calling it the Kung flu and spread lies and mis, um, mistruths about the origin of the virus. We saw numerous incidents of hate and unprovoked violence on a daily basis on TV, on the radio, on social media. Dion Lim was the reporter whose brave reporting catapulted this issue on, onto mainstream audiences and awareness and into our living rooms uh, screens almost daily. Dion, please share with us your committed mission of reporting hate crimes against AAPI community. So I'm really honored to be here for a number of reasons because this gets me thinking that the public still cares, that there is still interest, that even though it is not AAPI Heritage Month, which is May of every year, this is still a focus and an important topic in our communities. So as you heard at the beginning of the program, my name is Dion Lim. I'm a news anchor and reporter at ABC7 KGO TV. You can probably tell by my voice, this is what I do for a living, even when my mask is on. And I have a story about this particular shot, so remember it, because it plays a very pivotal role in my own story and how I came to be where I am today. I always like to start off with this graphic for everybody because in order to illustrate what I do and where I am today, where our society is, you have to understand and dig deep into your own past. There you see three graphics. This is my journey before coming to San Francisco in the Bay Area. I was a news anchor in Kansas City, in Charlotte, North Carolina, and in Tampa Bay. I used to ask this question, but people always guessed right, but I'll ask it anyway. What do those three places have in common when it comes to me? I was the first and only Asian American person to be at the helm of a main newscast in those stations, in those markets. And this was only in the past 15 years. How is that possible? What was interesting for me is that 
I didn't really understand the significance. Yes, I would ride the coattails of saying I was the first. This was my foot in the door. But guess what? It turns out that in order to actually be effective, you can't just have a seat at the table. You have to do something with that seat. And that's something I didn't understand. Because when I was in public, no joke, in all three of those places, people would come up to me and they'd go, hi, news lady. Oh, nice to meet you. You're Connie Chung. I'm so glad you guys got that reference because for the younger generation, they have no clue who Connie Chung is. And I never really knew what to say because after all, at the time, I was maybe 22, maybe 30, maybe 35, still didn't know what to say. Now, fast forward to here in the Bay Area, my first couple years in San Francisco, and everything looked so glamorous. I spent three years on the red carpet for the Oscars. I would go on the road with the Golden State Warriors covering their NBA Finals runs in Cleveland and Toronto. Everything seemed so great. And I mean, look, I'm volunteering with kids with disabilities in Hong Kong. I mean, there was a poster, and there still is a poster at ABC7 that reads, Dion Lim finds the good how quickly things would change with the pandemic. But before we got to when the coronavirus pandemic broke out, there was also the not so glamorous, what people don't necessarily remember, the mass shootings, the California wildfires, and the stories that really weighed heavily. And the burnout, I say, is very real. On the left-hand side, that was my first day, by the way, at KGO. I had never covered wildfire before, coming from all of those different markets. And someone shoved a big red go bag in my face and said, there's a fire retardant suit, there's a helmet, and there's a gas mask inside. Go. And that was it. And I was at the fires for more than a week. Also, when it comes to Thousand Oaks, I was at Disneyland for the very first time. I woke up that morning, the happiest place on earth, only to be called to the scene of a country western bar shooting, and then subsequently the fires in Malibu and Thousand Oaks. And I was there for many, many days. My poor husband, who was there to go to Disneyland with me, was stuck also along for the ride. And as horrible and as terrible as all of these things were, and how important they were to be covered, I thought to myself, most journalists can do this. Most people who study and know how to put this story together can, can, can make something fill two minutes of news. And I actually considered for a long time, maybe this was my time to exit. I started Googling PR jobs, Google, or communications, Amazon. I didn't get any of those jobs, by the way. Turns out I'm not very qualified. But then something shifted when the pandemic hit. And I suddenly realized that seat at the table had, along with it, a voice and a purpose. There were stories like this, and I apologize for the graphic nature, but I do believe it's important for people to see that way you understand the gravity of what is happening. And what you see on your screen is a tiny, tiny fraction of one percentage of all the things that go on in our communities. The most high profile one being the 84-year-old grandfather who was pushed and killed in his Anza Vista neighborhood in San Francisco. I remember the moment I was sitting in my office and my sources had come through with the surveillance video, and like wildfire, it took off. Because up until this point, no one visually saw what was happening or understood how callous some of these actions were. I'm sure those in law enforcement see it all the time, but the general public. And then to hear the pain of this family and have them explain what it is like feeling under attack. In the center is a 85-year-old woman who was stabbed in broad daylight as she was pushing her cart full of groceries in San Francisco. She was with her friend who was also attacked. That is a serrated hunting knife that is in her body. And on the right-hand side, Mr. Lee, all he was doing was coming home from work. He was coming home from work as a postal worker, a new immigrant to San Francisco when he was stabbed multiple times. And I want to point something out, and this will come in handy later in our discussion, that none of these cases have been categorized as a hate crime. But we'll explain why they could very well indeed be hate motivated. So something shifted in my thinking of what I did for a job, because it was no longer a job. It became a mission. And I wrote in the San Francisco Chronicle early on in the pandemic how this gave me purpose, how now 
with the ability to broadcast for hundreds of thousands of people and then on social media reach millions of people, it was my time to advocate for Asian Americans. And there's a difference between activism and activation. Because as a journalist, because we have ethical rules that we abide by, I am not going to be like that rapper with a megaphone beating my chest getting people to stand up or being like those young people that Dr. Zhang mentioned who are holding rallies and advocating for things. But what I can do is I can bring to the forefront stories that are important to people in the community. I can, with my voice and gaining trust of others, get Asian Americans who are typically people who don't speak out, people who keep their head down, their nose clean. I mean, my mother told me at the beginning of the pandemic, stop reporting on Asian Americans because it makes us look bad because it brings shame to the Asian American people. Can you imagine? That was one of the most heartbreaking moments of my life. There are memorials and vigils that happen. I can't attend them, but I can cover them. And that I think is the difference in journalism playing a role in getting the community on board to activate them to do something. I'm the daughter of immigrants from Taiwan and Hong Kong. I touched upon what my mother said to me. I remember being a child and we talked about this is that I remember feeling so different and so alone because I was one of three kids in my school in Connecticut, rural Connecticut, that were Asian American and the other two kids were adopted. So I had an extra unique lens. And my mother told me that if I sought help for all of the things that I was feeling, that I would be deemed a crazy person. So for more than 30 something years, I avoided seeking assistance. And I also committed the cardinal sin of being on television and is showing your emotions and crying because you're not supposed to do that. But guess what? I've done it three times now. I'm not proud of it, but I couldn't help it. And in a way, showing that vulnerability has been my greatest strength. That empathy in being able to sympathize and empathize with victims and people in our community who are going through the same thing opens up the doors to people coming to you and trusting you and being able to tell that story and start that cycle of then seeking help or reporting their crimes. And that's something that I perhaps is, am most proud of out of all of this. I look ahead and solutions also help take the burden off the mental health toll. I see some of the reporting payoff, the volunteer security patrols that burst onto the scene after some of the reporting happened. I was getting attention from celebrities, Daniel Day Kim, for example, Daniel Wu, Lisa Ling, all of them would contribute and spread some of these stories. In Oakland's Chinatown, there'd be different patrol groups and a patrol group actually helped this 79 pound, 82 year old woman after she was hit with a frying pan in the middle of the day. They flagged down OPD and immediately were able to get her the assistance that she needed. Also the air horns that were distributed early in the pandemic. I was so happy because these merchants that thankfully because of a young woman's father who had seen my coverage raised $6,000. So that way they could buy them for the merchants. And then one year later, a pregnant store owner who was in the process of being robbed was able to use that air horn. So even though it feels like some days it's two steps forward and 10 steps back, the steps are at least happening. I wind things down by saying, what's next? That's the big question, right? Because on a daily basis, I'm still confronted with things like cries of fake news. But I believe that statistics gathering, the work that Russell and Stop AAPI Hate is doing, is going to be crucial because the numbers do not lie. The studies do not lie. If you think what I'm bringing to you is biased, then by all means, you can go ahead and think that. But the studies are true. We talked about laws and initiatives and pushes to get people to talk about mental health and to also be a part of initiatives to educate because education oftentimes is one of the big factors in stopping this. And then also finding the fortitude not to give up and that perseverance. And for me, it comes in the form of having recognition such as being on the list of most impactful Asian Americans um, along with Kamala Harris among others. So I take the small wins these days even though the attention is nowhere near what it was back in May of 2021 when New York Magazine was calling me or TMZ or other national broadcasts, I did get invited to the White House this past May 
here President Biden is taking a selfie. The first one he took was terrible, so I actually told him that there was a shadow. I said, Mr. President, can you please move your arm? I apparently got the attention also of ABC World News Now and America This Morning and was asked to be a part of their broadcast earlier this year. And then also was able to be recognized along with Michelle Yeoh and others at the Gold House Gala, the first inaugural one. But perhaps the most proud moment for me was my mother and father in the top right hand corner. This is Connecticut this past April. And going back to that first slide of me standing there in Chinatown, what I was doing there was I was part of a ABC 2020 special. And growing up, my mother and father insisted I watched 2020 so I could learn how to pronounce words accentless. So I had good English, unlike they did. And after they told me to stop reporting, after they told me that what I was doing was shameful, it was that 2020 program that they could tune in from in Connecticut and say, you've made it and we're proud of you. And for me, that meant the entire world. So I conclude, find me please, if you have questions or comments or leads, or if you know anything that you think needs to be brought to the forefront, find me on social media. It may take me a few days to get back, but there is someone listening and I'm here for you guys. So thank you. Thank you for never backing down when, when it resulted in your own anguish and despair. Because we feel that, and we thank you. You are an amazing inspiration. I'm sorry. Um, um, as both Russell and uh, Dion have stated, anti-Asian sentiment has taken a huge toll um, personally on them and our entire AAPI community, particularly when it comes to mental health issues like anxiety and depression. The fear is very real. This impact on our mental well being has been significant. And Dr. Segal uh, is here to provide some insight and perhaps uh, share some advice of uh, how people can cope uh, during these challenging times. Dr. Segal? Those are very, very um, tough acts to follow. So I'm just going to take a deep breath and uh, compose myself and do my best. So I am absolutely honored to be part of this amazing conversation. I think it all begins with a conversation and we just take it from there. So as a psychiatrist, I deal with the intersection of where mental health and the stresses of people's life come together to impact and have sometimes negative medical impacts. So racism and hate crimes are extremely traumatic events and they take a real toll on not just the physical and mental, but the emotional and the spiritual being of a person. It's important to note that even small microaggressions, however small or seemingly inconsequential they may feel or seem, have an impact and take a toll on the psyche. These events are never alone. They never stand alone events. They have a ripple effect and they reverberate through families, through communities, and even through generations. So these horrendous crimes don't just humiliate or dehumanize. They tend to impact the very core of a person's identity, and they rob the person of their dignity. And it takes a really significant toll on their self-esteem, their sense of belonging, their sense of self, and it instills fear in entire communities and often communities that are already struggling to make use of government agencies, law enforcement, mental health, physical health. And unfortunately, these are the people who are supposed to protect them and people that they can go to fearlessly. And these are the doors that begin to shut for these community members. So um, the humiliation leads to further shame and silencing and soon you realize that all the help and the justice that they so truly deserve is not theirs. So the separation and the segregation again begins to get intensified. Now, trauma reinforces the lack of control that so many of these community members already experience. 
They look at all the societal injustices going on around them. They feel absolutely voiceless. They feel they're not able to speak up. And if they do, their voices are not heard. In fact, it's like a cloak of invisibility that is thrown over them and they just sort of retreat into the darkness. And so the way that some of the groups will turn and you know try to protect themselves against this is by internalizing some of the negative attitudes of the dominant group. And how I see this happen in my practice is when I see second generation young Asian Americans, and I see how they have embraced sort of very Eurocentric uh, values, or they try to distance themselves from their own cultural heritage. So much so they don't want to be seen in their own traditional dress, eat their traditional food, even distance themselves from their traditional names. And I feel that, you know, this causes so much distress and it can be deeply disturbing to see someone not come into the identity that they are meant to have, but actually being pushed away and dislocated and sort of moving away from that, that central core of their own self. So, you know, the stress generated in these very, very stressful events, and you know, we've talked about and seen and had this sort of visual impact of seeing so, much, so many of these horrific crimes being acted out. And this creates for the individual a very chaotic inner environment. So it creates a sense of unsafety, it creates a sense of high anxiety. And in order to find peace or calm this internal environment, the person is getting more and more isolated away from their day-to-day -day experiences. So these little microaggressions, these little experiences, they begin to, you know, what I call contaminate. They begin to contaminate your connection to your life, to your world, and everything that you experience from that point on is now going to be contaminated by your past experience. And so as the person is so focused on suppressing these high anxiety, these terrible internal states, this chaos, it's going to come at a cost. It's going to come at the cost of engagement with your life as it is unfolding. So you begin to be present but not participate in your life. And um, it's, it's really the mental health symptoms that we see that Dr. Jung sort of spoke about come from this inability sometimes of the human being to manage this internal world and when they cannot, we end up seeing mental health symptoms, which can include post-traumatic stress, depression, anxiety, insomnia. And so what starts out as a very normal stress response in the person, if untreated, can turn this person into someone who's hypervigilant, who's um, you know on edge all the time, gets depressed, gets fearful, gets angry, gets isolated, and at the end of it, you know you see them using substances, you see them using uh, alcohol to try and suppress this internal chaos. In other words, the trauma is getting trapped inside the body, and of course, the physical manifestations of trauma are then not far behind. You start to have cardiac disease, you start to have you know, high blood pressure, you begin to have um, other inflammatory diseases, your immunity goes down, your risk of having COVID actually goes up. And so you start to have all of these physical symptoms beautifully outlined in a book called The Body Holds the Score, which talks about how trauma impacts all aspects of our body, whether it's the mind, the body, or the brain. And you know, as Dion had uh, spoken about, trauma thrives on not talking about it. So oftentimes, it's important to remember that even if we don't talk about our traumas, our internalized stresses, our coping mechanisms, the way that we process or move through certain traumas can certainly impact the people that we do business with, our families, our communities, even our children. And it's been shown that, you know, when there is persistent, ongoing, chronic trauma, it can make a difference to your genetic code. It can make changes to where, how you hold the world, your perspective, your relationship to it, the stress and the, the depression, the anxiety you feel is something that you can then pass on to your children as a modified genetic material. 
And the child who themselves may never have experienced the trauma will sometimes have that same traumatic response to difficult situations, have an exaggerated fear response, be more predisposed to being anxious as a young adult themselves. And it's been shown that oftentimes, when you have a child who is growing up with this genetic predisposition, growing up in a family where the parents have been subject or victims of trauma, this combination of a difficult home environment where talking about things is not condoned, where talking through processing, advocating for yourself, standing up, being seen, being heard, are not things that are either modeled or advocated or encouraged. The child grows up with a long mental health struggle ahead of them. So it's really important to keep in mind that trauma is, I think it's sort of the driver of a lot of mental health issues. You know, when someone comes to see me in my practice, and it doesn't matter whether what they're coming in for is panic attacks or anxiety or depression, I always try to go to the root cause of what is it within them that is unresolved? Because oftentimes the anxiety, the depression, these are merely ways that our body speaks to us. You know, it's the only language we have of somatic distress or psychological distress that should sort of push us or steer us in the direction of looking for causes that we can address. Shame and guilt, these are automatic silencers, right? They get in the way of us talking about anything that is important or pertinent that we should talk about. And so especially when it comes to traumatic events, shame and guilt silence everything, all dialogue. And so the experiences start to get cast away into the shadows, they get relegated to the sidelines, and they're never spoken about. And somehow then the, we perpetuate this, this cycle of stress, this intergenerational trauma that begins to get transferred down. I strongly believe that having a dialogue and raising awareness through um, an audience like this or forums such as this are the first essential step for any lasting change to happen. And it really breaks my heart that anybody should experience trauma merely based on how they look or what they do or how they dress. And so I do also believe, the optimist in me also believes that we can find hope in the face of hate through forums like this and through open conversations and advocacy and taking an active role in our own wellness. And I really do find that the more we put ourselves out to meeting people from different cultures and different races, what starts out initially as no meeting ground or we are so different in so many ways, but as we talk more, we realize that that distance starts to narrow and suddenly we are more the same than we are not. And you know, the language of suffering is the same. I see patients from every race, culture, background, and ultimately after a while, I forget you know, who the person was. It's one human being connecting with another human being. And I think if in some way we can, we can bridge that, those artificial barriers of culture and class and you know, traditions and just come together over things we believe in and can see eye to eye, I think that's a great start. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Segal, um, for helping us to understand what depression and anxiety, where it comes from, that so oftentimes it's within us and we just are not aware. And having that ability to have conversations with others is very powerful. Thank you so much. Well, after hearing about many different uh, types of incidents that have happened, horrible attacks, we really need to take a moment and talk about public safety. <laughs> Uh, that it surrounds some of these attacks and crimes. Sergeant Tang uh, is going to be our next speaker. And um, we'd like to hear, has there been an uptick in uh, Asian-related uh, crimes since the pandemic? And what public um, service uh, measures have we in place uh, to address these types of issues? So if you'd please join us. I've seen Oakland change. 
Oakland has devolved. Every week, uh, as a kid, I would go to Chinatown with my mom. It would just be my mom, my brother, and I, and we would go to Chinatown freely. We would buy everything there. Um, and it felt very, very safe. It, it felt like a community. Uh, my grandparents, who lived uh, on Lake Merritt, they would take the bus or they would walk to Chinatown and then they would walk back. My grandfather needed to get his newspaper, his Chinese newspaper, every day. So he'd make the walk and then he would hang out with his friends. And that was our thing growing up as kids. I felt very much protected by my parents going to Chinatown or just traveling freely. As we age, um, I think all of us, as we become adults, we become parents to our own parents. Um, and we start taking care of our parents like they did to us. Um, once again, I'm a police officer. And since the pandemic uh, and since 2020, things have changed. Um, I have rules now. Um, there are rules. One is that they're not allowed to go to Chinatown without me being there. So their primary care physician is still in Chinatown and they're comfortable with this doctor because they speak the same language, they're from the same area. Um, but based on what we see on the news, um, what we hear about, what we read about, and also me being a police officer, I'm uncomfortable with them traveling alone. They're in their late 70s. So the rule is their appointments are always based on my days off. I'm off on Mondays. So that's when we do doctors and things like that. And that's when they can do their shopping there. But they're also not allowed to go to the bank by themselves. So if they go to the bank, it has to be with me. Um, I walk them in. I'm like their private security detail when they travel. Uh, am I being paranoid? Probably. Um, but I also have the factor in the fact that they are elderly. Um, and what we have once again seen uh, towards the Asian community. Um, I'm thankful to be working here in Fremont. We, we have a large Asian population here in the city of Fremont. And what we see nationally with the increase of AAPI hate crimes in Fremont, oddly enough, we've actually seen a decrease. From pre-COVID to COVID, there's actually a decrease in the Asian-related hate crimes. However, I put an asterisk to this, um, and I am still an academic. I, I'm a cop, but I'm still an academic. So I studied and I looked through all of our cases in terms of uh, crimes and those involving Asian victims. And there are more than likely a lot of crimes that could potentially be categorized as hate crimes. And then the question is, why aren't they? And, and there are several factors. Uh, one, oftentimes the, the victim doesn't speak English. Uh, an elderly victim or uh, an Asian person who's new to this country does not understand uh, the language that's being used to them that's incendiary, that's racist, that's hate motivated. They don't understand. All they understand is that their purse was taken or my car was broken into or I was knocked on the ground and they stole my cell phone, right? So oftentimes crimes that may be simply just robberies or theft could potentially be hate motivated. The Fremont Police Department, and I'm speaking on behalf of the Fremont Police Department, um, it takes hate crimes very, very seriously. Uh, and, and the reason for that are threefold. Um, and Dr. Segal talked about it. The first uh, being the, the sheer trauma of it. So it's the trauma of the incident, but the future trauma and the continual trauma that, that arises by being a victim of crime. Secondly, the reason why we take hate crimes so seriously is because they can escalate into further violence or they can escalate into retaliation, which is a, a, another terrible scenario. Uh, and lastly, it's the, the lasting impact. And Dr. Segal talked about it and Dion talked about it too. So a hate crime isn't just the victim, it impacts the community as a whole. So when my mom hears about another Chinese woman being attacked in San Francisco Chinatown, she too feels like the victim that she needs to further barricade in her own house, that she doesn't pick up the phone or, or look through the people of the door, doorbell is, is rung. So that's what we talk about with that lasting impact. And per our department policy at Fremont, we take hate crimes very seriously for those three reasons. It's the trauma aspect, the potential for escalation or retaliation, 
and three, the lasting impact to the community as a whole, once again, Fremont being a heavily Asian community. But I think it's important for us to also talk about the difference between uh, a hate crime versus hate speech. Um, there are often, not often, there are incidents where officers in our city have responded to incidents where an individual says, go back to China or things like that. Now they are protected under the First Amendment under freedom of speech. And I think we can all agree that it is what we consider hate speech, but it is not a hate crime, meaning that we can arrest that individual for that. A person can believe whatever they want to believe as hateful or as much as we think it is, they can say whatever they want. Where hate speech becomes more of a concern for us is when it escalates into threats of violence, uh, blackmail, or threats, things like that is when it becomes or escalates into a crime. The concern though is that oftentimes citizens are like, well, it wasn't really a hate crime, so maybe I don't need to call the police. I urge all of you and, and our stakeholders here is that it's always important to give us a call, to assess the call and figure out if there is anything that we can do. Once again, I talk about escalation a person who has hate speech or has hate motivations, they might escalate into something of violence. And that's something that the Fremont police or any police agency would wanna know that an individual potentially has these thoughts that could potentially get more serious. What we've seen in a lot of previous active shooter incidents, when you peruse through their individual social media or some of the websites that they look at, you see a lot of uh, hate motivated sites. And that's why it's important that uh, the police work in collaboration and partnership with our community um, to understand individuals like that, to potentially get them assistance or help or support, and then for the community to be aware as well. Like I said, since uh, pre-COVID to COVID, we've actually seen a decrease uh, in uh, Asian-related uh, hate crimes, it's, which is, we're very, very thankful. And then it led me to start, once again, thinking as an academic, well, why is that? And, and I think that Fremont is unique. We have 235,000 people in our city, but our community, as large as it is, and it continues to grow, you guys are a very involved community, which, which I appreciate. Um, these are homeowners who have cameras, who are good witnesses, who call our dispatch uh, when they see and encounter problems. And I think oftentimes in other cities that are struggling more, and there's a whole slew of other sociological factors to it, they don't call the police, they don't call 911. Here in Fremont, we are very, very thankful and fortunate for the relationship that we have with our community. And I think that's why we've been able to solve or even prevent a lot of issues. Uh, Sue talked about my current role. I currently uh, manage our school resource officer team and actually work with Trustee Jones uh, pretty, pretty often. Um, and what we currently see in terms of current trends is that um, our youth, while I applaud their level of activism uh, and their interest in what is going on, what we've noticed, at least from the school resource officer team, is that oftentimes our kids are using hate speech when they're on Instagram, or on these group threads. And the fear, once again, is that that escalates or that it causes other issues that go on within the schools. So like I said, I, I, I applaud the fact that you guys are all here as interested stakeholders. However, I think in terms of stemming the tide or trying to look towards the future, um, we need to focus on our youth and channel that activism, but then also channel that in terms of good decision making and, and having these very difficult conversations with them as well too. Um, uh, we talked about statistics. Uh, our department and our officers are, are trained in our hate crime policies. There is actually a checklist that we give our officers for hate crime related issues. Uh, we take it as seriously as we do as a sexual assault in terms of have all the notifications been done? Are we looking for cameras? Are we knocking on doors? Are we doing the best of our ability to get a suspect description if necessary? 
So our officers are trained and bound by that. And then they're also bound by law as well. Um, once again, I, I thank you for the invitation to, to speak to you today. Um, I certainly can answer specific questions. I know that there's a, a Q&A portion of it. Um, but once again, I, I'm very thankful to be working in Fremont and I'm thankful to the community members here because you guys take a very, very proactive approach to crime. You guys call, you guys keep yourself safe, you guys have cameras. These are all helpful because public safety is not something that I deliver, it's something that we deliver as a community as a whole. So I don't want you to think that the Fremont Police is the sole person that's, uh, or sole entity that's keeping the city safe. It relies heavily, heavily on the community. And I, I thank you guys for that partnership. Thank you so much, um, Calvin, for all these public safety um, strategies that you've uh, outlined for us. And it's true, Fremont is really an island in the Bay Area in the sense that we do have that sense of community. And I look out at the audience and there's so many familiar faces. And it's because we have that connection and that pride um, and civic pride, I should say. And we have organizations like Washington Hospital that put on these types of forums so that we can have these thoughtful conversations. So right now we're going to, with the uh, remaining time that we have, uh, we're going to be uh, having a Q&A. And while I can ask questions of our panelists, we certainly would like to hear from you. So if any of you have a question that you'd like to answer, you could raise your hand and we'll bring a microphone to you and uh, go from there. So uh, while I don't see any hands, just, oh, okay. Here we have our first one, Dr. Albert Wang, uh, who is a community leader in our AAPI uh, community. Uh, he, is a, he has been so active in everything that has to do not only with Asian concerns, um, but also because he's a physician, he has that expertise as a healthcare pro a provider. And when we have issues, the go-to person oftentimes, the first person I will call is Dr. Albert Wang. So Albert. Thank you for your kind introduction, Sue. Um, question mostly for Dr. Segal, but I think some of you would have insight into this as well. You described quite eloquently the mental health issue with the victim and people who look like the victim and our youth and our elderly. What do you think about the other side? Do you have any insight into why people attack people based on race? And racism to me is sort of a psychiatric disorder, a psychological disorder, so is violence. Why do they do that? <laughs> Can I just talk? Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, that's a great question um, because, you know, I have pondered that question myself and try to look at it from the other, from the other side. And uh, what I find is that often when there is someone being hateful towards another person, I don't think it is directed as at the individual person themselves. It is coming from their own fear, their own internal sense of threat, fear, whether it's coming from an economic disadvantage, whether it's coming from their own personal sense of insecurity in their life. But that is something that I do try to, um, you know, teach my patients a lot about that when in any relationship, this is a particularly bad one, but in any relationship, when someone is being difficult or being, you know, not themselves, 95% of the time it has to do with the other person, not you. So we all tend to internalize that I must have done wrong to bring this upon myself. And if there is one thing that you can take away and remember is it has nothing to do with you. It has to do with either lack of education, awareness, feeling threatened that provoke those kind of responses. Make a quick response. I think people are really afraid of COVID-19, right? And we're under this fear and the fear of threat. And then when people use the term Chinese virus, it associated the virus with Chinese people and the virus became a Chinese racialized disease. And so when people saw Asians and they're already afraid of the disease and they get triggered and they go into fight or flight response. So I'm not blaming people for being intentionally racist in this current surge. I think a lot of people are just have this implicit bias 
and think, uh oh, that person could be dangerous and they go into fight, which is you would harass them or flight where you would shun them. So I think it's actually pretty easy to understand why people are attacking Asians at this moment. Even I have that implicit bias. Mm -hmm. Early in the pandemic, if I saw an Asian wearing a mask versus a non-Asian wearing a mask, I'd quickly think, oh, that Asian is probably more dangerous, right? And more of a threat to me. So we all adopt this implicit bias. And so, you know, that's what I'm saying. Asians can be just as racist as everyone else. Yeah. And so we're under threat so we can respond in like kind to go into fight or flight. And I've seen the Asian community go into fight or flight. As an older person within the community, one of the things that I stress is, is remaining vigilant at, at all times. Um, my parents, like I said, who are in their late 70s, have habits. And they stick to their whatever, their schedule and their rituals and when they do things. And I'm against it. I'm completely against it. We, we don't want our community members to have to change everything that they do. However, what we encourage is that our citizens are aware of their surroundings, go at times in which there are other people that are gonna be around. But along that, be vigilant as you're traveling home too. What we've seen in, in some cases, not here in Fremont, but where the suspects or the offenders follow uh, the victim home. And that's where the assault or the attack or the violence happens. So that's where your drive, my, once again, I use my parents for everything. <laughs> they they wanna go to Ranch 99. All right, let's go to Ranch 99. Um, <laughs> and so I want them to be aware as they're driving home Hey, are there similar cars that you saw that were following you from the parking lot home? Um, I'll encourage them to take different routes home. Don't just keep taking the same path, but take different routes home too. But one of the things that we also do, at least in my family, is my parents will tell me when they're going places as well. So that's what I would also encourage is tell the loved one, hey, I plan on going out today. I plan on doing this today. Um, I refuse at least in my family, to accept the fact that we have to change everything about what we do. Instead, I think it's about doing it more creatively and doing it more awarely too. So um, as a brand new police officer, even as a current police officer, some of the things they train us on is always be aware of where your exits are. Um, never having your back to the door, being able to be aware of people that come in and out. Those are small little things and habits that can increase your situational awareness exponentially um, and protect you, um, especially once again for our older community. Um, rituals are good. However, being fluid and creative with it and always being aware of your surroundings are your number one thing. Well, I'd like to add to that that uh, very similar to everyone's uh, experience, I, my mother, who's 95, lives in Oakland, Chinatown. And when the pandemic hit, it was bad enough to having to be at home by yourself, not having anyone be able to come and visit you. Uh, it was very challenging. And when we did visit, you know, we had our mask on, we brought the, the groceries for the week or the meals and what have you. But those visits were so important to us because that was the only time that we could connect with them. But then when you layer on the anti-Asian violence and attacks that were happening, particularly at the epicenter was Oakland and San Francisco Chinatown. And when you have uh, people that are, uh, you know, attacking you from behind, you know, that surprise, that element that captures, and then particularly the, the seniors. I mean, this is something that, as G Jerry said, you know, you saw it on television. The people were petrified of leaving even going down to the mailbox because they didn't know what was behind them or what could happen. And so I think that that added to the, the stress that uh, we've uh, talked about this morning. Um, so another thing, too, is that those people that live in Chinatown or Vietnamese town or, or other uh, areas, um, oftentimes they're monolingual. And so how do we refer them to services where there perhaps isn't any other language than English. Is that something that you could address? Uh, I know from the, at least from the police side of it, 
doesn't matter who calls 911, um, our officers, when they respond, if it's a language that they're not familiar with, we do have access to the AT&T language line. So we'll try to get an operator that can do the translation for us. Um, so I don't want uh, members of the AAPI community to think that, hey, just because uh, your loved one doesn't speak the language that we can't help you. Uh, that's very much not the case. We even have a FaceTime app for our hearing impaired community where we can help that way. Um, but I'll let the I'll let Dr. Segal talk about resources as well too. I think that um, you know one of the things I do tell and try to spread the word as much as I can. Oftentimes, the interface that you trust the most is your primary care physician or your general practitioner. And those tend to be people you've known for a long time. And so it doesn't matter whether what you think you're experiencing is a mental health issue or you know a life issue, but talking to a professional about it is definitely a starting point. And uh, within our own, and I'll tell you, I'll give you my own personal example that you know over the last two, two and a half years, uh, since there's been so much of violence and racism in so many different communities, it really did help raise my own awareness about specifically asking for it in the patients that I treat. So, you know, I have a little intake form where patients, when they're first calling my office, have to give sort of a brief history. I went ahead and added a little question in that after, I think about two years ago, that specifically asked, have you ever been a target of racism? And it was amazing to me how much people were willing to talk about it when they got the message that someone is aware. So I think cultural awareness is a big piece of this. You know, we all tend to stay within the communities that we belong to. And the moment you step out, you realize, oh my God, there's this entire world around me that I was ignorant about. So I say, educate yourself. And you know, if there's one simple thing, for example, if I'm in a checkout stand, I will now make it a point to actually have a conversation with that person. So I'm trying to see people as human beings, as whole persons, not just the job they do or how they look and what they See. There was a um, establishment of a federal hotline crisis center uh, call, which is modeled on 911, and the number is 988, and it is a suicide and crisis hotline that will immediately connect you with a, uh, a mental health specialist, and it is also available in 140 languages. So if if uh, you know of someone who may not speak uh, English very proficiently, they can call that number and get help. So that, again, that's 988. Uh, they also have deaf and hearing uh, for uh, the hearing impaired individuals, and you can either call or text. So that's something brand new. Okay, um, I thought I saw a question. Oh, Ken, is that you, Ken? Yeah. <laughs> Ken Pon. Uh, as the officer was talking about uh, uh, anti, uh, but was it um, hate speech versus hate crime? As you were talking about it, um, it seemed to me that what you were talking about is how a police officer might respond to something, or whether a police officer might intervene. And you, you mentioned something about it's you know the uh, uh, hate speech is different from a hate crime in that there's no threat related to uh, a hate speech versus a hate crime there is. And I would say that uh, there is a threat. Uh, I think what you're referring to was a physical threat. Uh, what I'm thinking about is a mental threat. It's kind of an invisible attack on people uh, that causes a reaction. You mentioned that if someone attacks someone and you try to prevent them from attacking. Uh, but what I'm hearing also from the doctor is that you know the mental health side, if I'm being attacked mentally, uh, I might have a reaction as well, which could also be a physical uh, attack. So I think it's something uh, we need as a society to decide uh, or figure out how to address, uh, because I don't like the idea of hate speech any more than anyone else does. Uh, but I will not say it does not have an effect on people. I think it does. We need to find a way to uh, mitigate, I guess is the term nowadays, uh, you know, the threat from uh, mental health attacks. 
No, I appreciate that comment, and I apologize if I wasn't clear, but uh, yes, I agree with you. Uh, hate speech is basically a precursor to a hate crime. So uh, I, the example I used was the dissection of active shooters uh, in the past and looking at their social media and looking at their posts. Hate speech escalated into a hate crime with a lot of these incidents. Uh, the idea of hate speech is important for officers to still investigate. And let me clarify that again, once again. Just if it's a hate speech, it is our policy as a department to still send officers to investigate. One, because we want to know who these individuals are. And two, because it is incumbent upon the officer in doing their investigation to potentially look through social media to see if they can find something that is related or uh, corroborating evidence to substantiate other things like a potential threat. So uh, I apologize if I wasn't clear, but I, I agree with you 100%. Hate speech is just as important because it is a preamble, a precursor to things that can culminate and build up into something that is uh, potentially violent or very, very dangerous. Thank you for the acknowledgement. Yep. I'd also like to follow up with that, uh, Sergeant, is that what is the difference between an anti-Asian crime versus a person who ha is a victim of a crime that happens to be Asian? Yeah, um, that's a great question. That's going to be largely based on what the victim can tell us or what victims or what witnesses say or what things like video surveillance will give us. I'll give you an example. Uh, I was a crimes against persons detective, so I specialized in sexual assault and child abuse. I was also the on-call detective uh, one evening on a weekend, it was a Saturday, and I got called to Alder Avenue to a report of an elderly Chinese man uh, who was simply working on his car, and uh, he was assaulted, and then the offender beat his head against the curb of the street. That's all we had. The case remains unsolved. It's something that still kind of haunts me to this day that I was not able to help this person get resolution for this case. My gut feeling is that this is a hate crime. This is an elderly Asian man simply working on his car. He was assaulted brutally uh, and his wallet was still there. There was no, but my victim couldn't tell me anything because they didn't speak English. My instinct is that it is a hate crime. But I have to be able to prove that in a court of law. In terms of how I present the charges to a district attorney, I have to be able to approve the elements that a hate crime occurred. The suspect said this. The victim heard him say this was because he was Asian. There was a witness. Uh, once again, this is once, uh, how I am really thankful about working in Fremont. We have great witnesses. You guys are great witnesses. When you guys are able to give us information and said, I heard that or I saw that, that helps us develop the case. So um, to, to your question, um, it, it's hard to prove the elements because I need to have all the facts. I know what it is. I know it probably is. But the burden that I have is I have to prove that uh, and convince a DA or a prosecutor that they have to pursue it as a hate crime, which uh, is a much more serious crime than just the regular assault. So it's, once again, to summarize, it's based on what the victim says. It's based on potentially a suspect confession. Looking at some of the reports in the past, we had a case where a suspect said, yeah, I." I assaulted this person because I don't like Indians. Okay, there we go. That's my hate crime right there. Um, so once again, it's the body of the investigative work that's needed to be able to prove the elements of a hate crime for us to pursue that versus simply just an assault on an Asian victim. Well, our time is coming to a, 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 an end because we have a um, certain time limit. So uh, I just want to thank everyone for coming. Please give our amazing panelists a round of applause.
Thank you so much for sharing your expertise and informing us and raising our level of awareness. Um, it's because of people like you that we feel safe, that we, we know that we have allies. Someone talked about allies, you know. When we reach out to others that are not like us, but we bridge that gap, this is where understanding can begin, if it hasn't already. Um, and so it's, it's really an important um, lesson that I think all of us have learned. And, uh, and so for that, I really want to thank Washington Hospital Healthcare System for organizing and presenting this uh, forum. Uh, is that Kathy Kimberlin? Over here, okay. Uh, Kathy Kimberlin is from uh, Supervisor David Halbert's uh, office, so thank you for attending. I just saw you there now. Um, so as I said, I hope that today your awareness has been increased and that you take away a greater appreciation and understanding for the anti-Asian hate that is out there, the violence that is out there. And uh, thank you, Dion, for keeping that in the public eye at a very high level. And when we see that it's not gonna go away unless we as community together, and I mean everyone, can come together and understand and help. Communication is key in that. So um, I just wanted to leave you with a closing um, thought. It will take all of us, you and you and you and me, to work together in partnership to bring justice healing, and peace to all of our communities. Um, so thank you again for coming. And now um, I would uh, like to invite uh, Washington Township Healthcare District Board President, Jeannie Yi, to offer some final remarks. Thank you, Suzanne. Thank you for moderating today. You did a fabulous job. Uh, thank you to our panel as well. And I want to say thank you to all of you who attended today. The fact that you took the time to register, get yourselves here, it says that something about this topic is important to you. It's resonating with you. And I know I'm going home with nuggets from each one of you. Um, I have been touched in ways I didn't expect. And, um, but yet I leave with hope because there are people like like them out there helping all of us. Washington Hospital has been here for almost 65 years. We, we love being here for you, for your happy times, and we love being here for these hard times as well. And as, as each one have said in, in various ways, we can make it through anything, no matter how hard it is, if we get through it together. And that's by having conversations, it's by education, uh, and I want you to leave with hope and um, be smart and safe and continue um, being like water. That's something my mom was a psych nurse. When I went, came home as a little kid upset by something that was said on a playground, something very hurtful, she said what Dr. Sagal said, it's not you, it's them. And um, you can't change the world, but you can change one person at a time. One, one kid on a playground, find a way that they're hurting, find a way to help them, find a way to make them more like you than you be more like them. And we have that challenge. All of us who grew up Asian in America have a story to tell, um, but it can make us better people, better community members. And we look forward to that, we claim that, we want to live that. So I thank you all for being here, for taking that interest, for um, being here for uh, this very, very special time on this very difficult topic. So now we have something for uh, Kimberly, our CEO, will be handing out uh, bouquets for our, our wonderful panelists. Thank you for Dr. Jung, our talented Dion Lim, our very own Dr. Sagal. We're so proud to have her as a, one of our, our physicians. And Sergeant Tang, thank you. Thank you so much.